Stop recording. Ah, it won't stay up. <clears throat> Something wrong with this thing. There we go. I figured out how to fix it. Hey guys, what's up? It's Sarah. I'm working on my vlogs. Um, I've been sick. I caught respiratory stuff again. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> it's been kind of crazy and... I do have some videos, but I'm trying to decide what to upload and what not to because some of the stuff I got is kind of chaotic and I don't think it should go on YouTube. Um, anyways, I got this Braille display for Christmas. It's called an Orbit Rito 20 and it's really small. It's really weird. Never seen a Braille display this small in my life. So cool because it's like super portable. And, like, you could easily bring it somewhere or, like, stick it in a bag or whatever. It's, like, super portable. It's awesome. Because um, all the Braille displays I've had before were really big. Um, the only thing that sucks is you get 20 cells. So it's this long before you go to the next line. But if you didn't do that, like, the longer the... The longer the, how to explain this, the longer this part is right here to make more cells, the bigger of a braille display you're going to actually have, which means that, A, they're way more expensive, like thousands and thousands of dollars, but B, it wouldn't be portable. So, like, if you had a 40-cell braille display, it would either be two of these right here in a row, so it would be wider, or it would be two lengths of these, and it would be, like, double this length. And so it would be really hard to, like, carry around and be portable. My last Braille display was, I want to say, 32 cells. But that one didn't, like, hook up to my iPhone, and this one does. And, um... Uh, this one does hook up to my iPhone, but the last, like, the one I had before this didn't. It was just a note taker. This is kind of cool because it's both. Like, I can actually open a file and take notes. Like, if you were like, hurry up, write this down, hurry up. You could, like, write it down. And these keys on the top here are for, like, you can type in, like, I'm not going to do it because I'm in a book that I'm going to redo. But um, you can, like, type in if you're in a file or, like, you can find words in a file or, like, if you um, are, like, in an edit field on an iPhone, like, if you're in a Facebook field or, like, if you are in a search field or, like, a YouTube field or any kind of edit field, you can use these Braille keys to type in Braille. Um, and then it will convert it to, well, I mean, if you type in a file in Braille, it'll stay. But, like, if you type on Facebook or Twitter or something... It will actually, like, when you hit the send button, it'll be regular text, but you can type in Braille, which is really cool because, um, I am a slow typer when it comes to the iPhone. Like, whew, I am not fast, y'all. It takes me a while to type, but I've always been a fast typer at Braille. Um, I have to get used to the buttons. I haven't, um, uh... But it's easy to type on. It's, like, super easy to type on. The keys are, like, good size, and they're pushable. And it's not like the iPhone where you have to, like, figure out which way to put the phone to make the cells go, and then you hit the wrong cells. I don't know how to explain it. You can type on the iPhone in Braille, but it is not easy. Like, I know a lot of blind people that love it, and I've done it a little bit. But by the time I get to where I can type the Braille, I could have written everything out. Because you go like this, and you put it in, like, tabletop mode, but then you start typing, and then the cells aren't always lined up, and it, like, it's supposed to be a really cool thing, but the iPhone's, like, probably half this size, and to type in Braille, your fingers have to go like this, and so, like, 
there's no space to type and your fingers have to hit like formations of dots. I don't know. A lot of blind people think it's easy. Some blind people don't. I do not. This is so much easier to type on. Um, like for me with the iPhone, like I think it's a cool thing that you can do it. But even though I'm a slow typer, it's easier for me to sit and type text in than it would be to try to use the Braille input mode on the iPhone. Way easier. But this, you just use these keys and you type like... Um, and you type with these keys, with the combinations of keys make the words. Um, so basically, people are always like, what in the world does this thing do? Basically, it's pins inside here, and it makes combinations of braille letters. So you can read the braille instead of listening to the talking. So you can read a braille book, or you can read whatever you're going to read. It's not a computer. It's not... People don't... You say Braille display and people don't really get the concept. It's basically just a piece of equipment that makes refreshable Braille. So, like, Braille comes... Like, it basically is a machine that um, takes pins and forms them into braille letters on the bottom of the screen and then when you move this it changes like that says maxucato try to read backwards that didn't say anything that says volume one of two so like it basically whatever you have loaded or whatever you're on on your iphone it takes that text and it converts it into braille down here so it's it's not it's not a computer, it's not like a high tech blind like it is high tech, but it's not like a a braille keyboard. It's not something weird like people are always like, do you have braille keyboards? No, you have regular keyboards, and then you have like this, um, which makes the braille on the bottom. So basically, this is, like, not something that you would use if you're not blind. Like, if you're blind and you can read Braille, you should go get one of these because they're very affordable. And I didn't think I would ever have a Braille display again ever in my life. And we started looking online. And I found one that was semi-affordable. Uh, maybe about double the price of this one. And I was going to save up for that, and then we found this one. And then I wound up getting this one. I was going to save up for it, but I, uh, my parents knew I wanted it, and I wound up getting it for Christmas um, so that I could, which is nice, because then I could spend, like, the rest of my money, like the money that I had on Vegas, which is what I needed to do. And um, <clears throat> my friend's going to come this year, so I'm really excited because I haven't seen her in, like, years. So I'm really, really excited, but yes, this braille is going to look backwards to those of you who are looking because I'm holding it right side up. The braille should actually go that way, but I'm holding it the wrong way. It's why it looks backwards. Um, it's funny because yesterday my mom was like, it's hard to write braille. And I'm like, no, it's not. And she's like, yeah, it is when you're not blind. And I'm like, well, it's hard to write print. <laughs> So, <coughs> whoa, okay, Instagram, don't need to know that. Um, it's kind of funny because, <clears throat> like, I know a lot of blind people that can write print, but my problem was, was that they didn't try to teach me print. Like, I learned Braille from kindergarten on, and that's, like, all I ever knew. And I haven't used it a lot lately just because my expensive braille display broke and I didn't, haven't got a chance to fix it and it didn't work with the iPhone anyway and so I haven't used it a lot. I do have braille on my microwave but I use it for like certain things like that, like marking stuff. Um, but I'm really excited to be able to read books and stuff again because um, if you pull up an ebook on the iPhone, you can read that. There's a bunch of books you can download from 
this thing called BARD, which is like a Braille and audio reading download service that's federally funded through the NLS, which is the National Library Service or the Library of Congress, whatever. <coughs> <coughs> and they have a bunch of books that you can download and read. And they have audio books and Braille books. But in order to read the Braille books, you have to have a Braille display. <coughs> and so, like, there's a lot of stuff you can do. And then, especially with it reading everything on your phone, like you could sit and scroll through face bleh, Facebook, or you can, like, sit and you can, like, scroll through Twitter, or you can read your text messages and stuff so you can actually read them instead of having to listen to the thing, like, talk all the time and be like, blah, 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 blah. People think blind people, that doesn't bother them. I don't know if it bothers other blind people, but there are times where I want to do something and I'm just like, I don't want all this noise. Like, I want this stupid thing to stop talking. I'm in church somewhere and somebody sends me this urgent message and I'm like, crap, I, I can't reply because I can't read the text because it'll start speaking. It's like, I know. It's part of being blind, I guess. So it's like a thing where, like, most blind people, including me, are used to the talking, but I get to the point sometimes where I'm just like, oh, gosh, please stop talking. And, like, <coughs> <coughs> the last time I looked at Braille displays, Apple had one, and it was $2,500. This is like a fourth of, wait, not even a fourth of that. And then the one that my mom found was like $1,000. I was like, oh, wow, they've gotten a lot cheaper because now you can buy just a Braille display instead of like a note taker and an internet browser and all the stuff. So like my mom was like, oh, this one's only like $1,000. So I'm like, okay. So I just started saving for that one. And then I started messing around and I just happened to put into Google like, um, what did I put? I, I don't know if I put in, like, most affordable Braille display or cheapest Braille display. I don't know what I put in there. But I found this one, and this one's, like, half the price of the, the one that, the $1,000 one. And, um, I think that, like... I don't know, like, this isn't for everybody, and it's probably not, like, the best Braille display that you can buy, because there's, like, five and $6,000 displays. But, like, most blind people cannot afford that, which I think is ridiculous, and most blind people's parents can't afford that. And it was, it's, it's really hard to get blind equipment, because I remember having a friend that needed some blind equipment when I was younger. And her parents had to, like, do a lot of stuff to get it because it was so expensive that they needed it and they didn't have the money because it was thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and they um, had to, like, get loans and stuff because this equipment can get so expensive. And so it was really exciting to find out that the Braille displays had come down in price a lot. And they were a lot more affordable. And then I found this one and I was super excited because if I would have had to save the money on my own instead of getting it for Christmas, it wouldn't have took me very long to save for. And I would have been able to get it quick. And it does have its downsides. But for being, like, under $1,000, it does a really good job. Like, if you want a bunch of technical stuff, like, it doesn't do translations and stuff. So, like, you can't do, like, like, I, if I, I don't know how to explain this. If you just sent me a file and said, open this, and I put it on this machine and I opened it, it's not going to translate it into what is called contracted braille, which is basically like a 
shorter, a shorthand, sort of, it's gonna spell out every single letter. Um, so like right here is the of sign. It's contracted of. But if you sent me a file that you had typed, it would say OF. The more expensive world displays, some of them will translate those files into contracted braille. But you don't necessarily need all that just to read books or play on your phone or be social. Like, maybe if you're still going to school, like, I could see where that might be something you need more. But for, like, just a person who wants to be able to use a Braille display with their phone or sit and read books and have a portable Braille display that they can take with them anywhere. They could take on the plane, you could take in a hotel room, you could take to like your Bible study so you could see the Bible and you could see the study guides that they're reading off of. Um, this works really well. And like I said, like not everybody's gonna want this because I know some people like you have to have the best of everything, but I am not like that. I think it's cool just to be able to have like braille um, displays in general. So I hope that with the price points of this braille display that a lot more people buy it and are able to buy it and that like for blind people that know braille that they that blind people are able to get like they're able to get more braille in the hands of blind people and hopefully it will encourage like um uh schools and states and stuff to teach braille because i know there's a lot of pushback and there's a lot of states that don't want to uh a lot of like they don't want to teach braille that much now because there's so much audio but to me, Braille is like invaluable and there's no way to like, I mean, it's basically like learning print. It's the equivalent. And if you don't learn either Braille or print, one of the two sighted people learn Braille, blind, or print blind people learn Braille, then you're basically illiterate and you can't spell. You can listen to somebody say like, hi, my name is Sarah but you're not gonna be able to write it down. And if you do write it down, you're not gonna be able to probably write it down with the proper punctuation because that is the stuff that Braille teaches you. So the fact that they're trying to go away from Braille and like states don't wanna teach it anymore and they have shortage of Braille teachers because blind people aren't learning Braille, it really irritates me because I feel like if you're blind, if you can see some, then you need to learn large point if you have enough vision to use it. But if you're like completely blind or almost completely blind, you should know Braille or be learning Braille if you're just going blind. And if you don't or you're not, then you need to be. And that's my opinion. But um, I digress. Anyway, so I hope that with these Braille displays becoming less inexpensive and becoming more portable, that like a lot more blind people will be able to get them and have the refreshable braille at their fingertips and be able to um, access it more because it's for like a long time now, it's like the expensive braille displays have been like being, uh, the expensive braille displays have been being purchased by state agencies and so those have pretty much been the people who have had access to the braille or people that saved up a lot or got a loan or something but with these being the way they are like even for students and stuff it's perfect to just stick in your bag and go to your next class or like I could see so many uses for one of these like I'm not in school anymore but like if I was I could see so many uses for something like this, and I read somewhere online that it is uh, something to do with the federal quota, so, like, federal agencies can buy these. Um, so I'm interested, and I wonder if 
a lot of the federal agencies are going to start buying stuff like this for their students instead of like the $6,000 note takers, depending on what their needs are for schools and stuff like that. Um, I'm not positive, but I think it's really cool that Braille displays have gone down a lot in price and... Most people would be like, well, why would you get the cheap one? Why wouldn't you buy, like, the $1,000 one? It's better, or the $3,000 one. That is because it takes a lot of money to save up, and to me, it isn't worth it. Not only are they big, they're, like, huge, because they have a lot more cells, so they're not as portable. But you don't always, depending on what you're going to use it for, you don't need all those options. And, like, this one... You can read books from that bard thing I was telling you about. And you can do pretty much anything on your iPhone. So for somebody who's not in school who just wants to be able to read Braille, I think it's perfect. Um, there are going to be those tacky people that are like, no, it's not. But I think it is. And um, so oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, my gosh. Um... But I think it is perfect for stuff like that. You do have to download the books onto this instead of opening them directly from the Bard mobile app. Which is uh, like an app where you can download the books from. So instead of doing that, you have to download the books onto the computer. And then you have to take the books from the computer onto here. <coughs> <coughs> but you can hook this up to your computer and transfer the books. It took me a while, but I transferred, like, I literally looked up all the, last night, I looked up every single religious book that they had in Braille on this website. This is not a lie. And I downloaded, like, all the Christian ones that were interesting to me. I didn't download them. I put them on my wish list. And then... Just now, I finally remembered my password to get in. Because I could get in on my phone, but I didn't know my password, so I couldn't get in on the computer. Found my password, downloaded the books, and copied them onto here. And it took a little while, but I copied, like, ten books or something. So, it's nice, because I'll be reading them for a while. And I could have just copied, like, one book at a time, but, like, if I'm going to go through that... I want to copy as many of them as I can and then not have to do it as often. So I'd rather copy, like, five books instead of, like, one book and then the next book and the next book. Because they'll stay on here and you can go from book to book to book. And you can also just, you know, when you're done, go to the next book. Like, you can store up to eight gigs on here. And if you need more memory, you can actually buy a third, up to 32 gigabyte Um storage card i think you can actually get as low as a four gigabyte one too but um this comes with eight gigs and these braille files are basically like a text file but they're formatted in braille so they're really really small so you can fit like a lot of them on this uh sd card that it comes with and so to me it was worth it to spend extra time and just download the whole bunch of books at once instead of downloading like one and then reading it and then download another um and then for the books on the iphone like i was looking at some ebooks last night the iphone you set your braille settings on the iphone so i set it at contracted braille so anything i read on the iphone is coming through as contracted braille so for like ebooks and kindle books and ibooks and stuff like that all you have to do is open them. For some reason, the BRFs are different, and I don't completely understand it. it. has something to do with translation and this not being able to translate. I don't really understand all that very well. Um, but you can just open the ebooks and you can read them. Like, I have some ebooks on my phone uh, from, like, before, and I just open them, and you can start reading them. And I'm really excited about that because... There is an ebook coming out by a singer that I like in about three weeks. And I'm super excited to buy it because I can read it off of here instead of having to listen to the voiceover read it like real monotonous. Because it's 
I don't know if it's going to have an audiobook or not. So I'll be able to, like, listen to that, read it. So it depends on what you're reading. You don't have to download every book to hear, but the bard books you from the library service, you do have to download to hear. Took me about two days to figure that out, but I have now figured that out. Um, and then the menus are in uncontracted braille, where everything is spelled out letter by letter. And it has something to do with the this thing not being able to translate braille or something. I don't really understand. Like, whatever it looks like it reads, it doesn't have the translation software to convert it into a different type of braille. I don't know how to explain it. It's really weird. But, I don't know. It makes, it doesn't even make sense to me. But that's what they say. That's why. So some of it's a little interesting to get used to because, like, the menus are all spelled out, which is actually really annoying. But I'm starting to get used to that part. But then, like, everything else, like, when it's hooked up to your iPhone or, like, if you download these formatted books onto here, it's all, like, in the contracted Braille, which is what most of the blind people use. So the only uncontracted Braille that I really have to read is the menus. And they're really short, simple things. And once you memorize the order of them, you can read through them super fast. So it's nice because, like, that's pretty much the only, like, uncontracted braille that you have to read, <coughs> basically. Um, and like I said, a lot of the more expensive ones wouldn't be like that. But, like, they can get really expensive. Like, my last note taker costed, like, $6,000. I didn't buy it. Somebody else did. And, like... That's ridiculous, guys. I'm sorry. I don't care if it translates. I don't even know. Like, Anakin to Darth Vader. I would not pay that much just for that. Like, somebody's going to give me that? Yeah, sure, go ahead. But um, for just wanting to read books and play on your phone and stuff, like, for being under a thousand dollars, I think this is really perfect for what on earth that car needs to be fixed. Somebody's car, yeah, go fix your car. Um, wow, that was really squeaky. Um, but like for just being like, I don't want to say a novice braille user because I'm not, but for just being like a normal braille user, not necessarily a heavy braille user that's going to school or doing math or computer or engineering or something funko. This is perfect and I hope that more blind people get a chance to get these and find out about these because then they will be able to read braille and read braille books if they like braille and be able to um have braille again without having to spend thousands of dollars on a braille display and like I said most of them are even bigger than this and this is really portable most of the really expensive ones are not so portable and my last one was you could carry it around but it was probably I should show it to you but I don't want to go dig it out of the closet it was at least two or three times this size so I mean yeah but anyway I digress the whole point of this video was not to talk about braille um the only thing that's interesting is like um it makes this noise every time you change the pins every time you move a line it makes this noise most of the other ones don't that I, the, like, the last one I had didn't make that noise. But I kind of like it because I know that it, the line is changing. And I know that it's doing something versus, like, it just popping up. So I'm starting to get used to that. And I kind of like it just because then you kind of know that something's happening and it's going to the next line. And you know that it's working properly and... I kind of like the noise. It's like a clean, crisp cut. Like, it sounds like you're writing Braille. 
and I like it because it reminds me of like writing on a braille writer and um, it, it sounds like you're typing out each line which is kind of neat. Um, I don't know if that would be annoying for students in class and stuff but I, I kind of like how it does that little noise there. Um, I think it's really cool. Um, but anyway, the whole point of this video, and I don't need to go through the orientation of this whole thing. There's, like, stuff online about how it is, and most of the people that watch my channel are not blind, so they don't need to know all that. Um, but apparently there's SD cards and there's micro SD cards, and this is an SD card, which is interesting. I thought maybe it was just a micro card and an adapter, but it's not an actual SD card which is bigger than the micro SD cards, which is common sense, and I'm super don't feel good right now, so that's probably something really stupid that just come out of my mouth, but, like, I just realized that yesterday when I got this, and I was like, oh, huh, duh. Anyways, <coughs> <coughs> I swore if I ever got my Braille display fixed years ago when I was going to camps for the blind, that I would read chapter 2 and 3 of Just Like Jesus by Max Licato. This has to be the best thing I have ever read in my entire life. I was in a dorm room the first time I read this bawling. I seriously kid you not, bawling. Like, I had to put the book down. And I didn't have a braille display at the time that it was on. So I had, like, one of those two-volume braille books. It was, like, a massive, like... I don't know if you've seen a volume of Braille, but it was like this massive volume. And I had to keep putting the book down, and like, I couldn't read, so I hope I can get through this. I couldn't read, and it is a little bit long, but you should listen to it, because I promise it'll change your life. Like, this has been etched in me since the first time I've read it, and I've never been able to stop thinking about it. It's something that will never leave my head, ever. And I always swore I was going to read it to somebody when I got a Braille display again, which I... After a while, I realized it was probably going to be never. And then they started getting cheaper. And then one day I was just talking to my mom and I said, Hey, like, I really want to do Braille. I'll be able to read Braille again and read Braille books. And they have one on Apple for like $2,500. And I was going to show her what it was. And she said, well, maybe we can find one that's not two thousand dollars and then that's when we started looking around and she started looking and I started looking and then we found these so um I swore that I would read it to somebody I don't think I told anybody that but in my head I was like I'm gonna read this to somebody so I wanted to read it to you guys just because it's like the most amazing thing I've ever read in my life and you will never forget it it will stick with you and I promise it will change the way you look at people the way you look at life just in general, like, how you treat other people. It just, this is the most amazing piece of literature I have ever read in my life. Like, I have read other stuff, I have listened to other books, but this is, like, the best two chapters of any book I have ever read in my life. And my face is way up here reading. I don't think there's a way for me to get this up to here so you can see me reading the Braille. But I really hope you enjoy this, and I hope it changes your life because this is just something that I feel like everybody needs to hear or read um, if they never read anything else in their whole entire life. So, yeah. I gotta find my page again, though I lost it. There we go. Um, so, yeah, I really hope that you guys enjoy this. And um, I just, this is the most incredible thing I've ever read. Um, but sorry if I bored you with all that Braille talk. I wasn't really sure how to, like, I wasn't really sure how to just briefly mention it. And I wasn't really sure how to, um, wasn't really sure how to segue into the next thing. Uh, but I promise I'm working on getting actual video vlogs up. But, um... What was I going to say? Um, if any blind people watch my video, hopefully this this video helps them out a lot. And they can, you know, find out about this Orbit Reader or save up for one or 
have somebody get them one if they can, um, something like that. So hopefully the beginning of my video might do somebody good if a blind person winds up seeing this. And um, by the way, because I didn't know this right away, the user guide to this thing is actually on this thing. It's on the internet too, but it's also on here built in. Uh, so that is nice to know if any blind people see this video. But anyway, so I'm going to start reading this. And like I said, I've always wanted to read this to somebody. I'm so excited. Like, this is the first thing I thought about right after I opened this. I started crying because I was like, they did not buy me that. That's a lot of money. And my mom's like, did you know you were getting it? And I was like, no. Like, I, I didn't think somebody would spend that much on a blind thing just because that hasn't happened in a long time. So I don't even know what to say about that. But um, I was really surprised. And I was, the first thing I thought about was reading this to YouTube because it's the best thing I've ever read. So, um, <coughs> oh, I need a drink. Um, okay, so chapter two is called Loving the People You Are Stuck With. Forgiving Heart, my, uh, a forgiving heart, I'm sorry. Um, okay. My first pet came in the form of a childhood Christmas Eve gift. Somewhere I have a snapshot of a brown and white Chinese pug small enough to fit in my father's hand, cute enough to steal my eight-year-old heart. We named her Liz. I carried her all day. Her floppy ears fascinated me and her flat nose intrigued me. I even took her to bed. So what if she smelled like a dog? I thought the odor just cute. I thought the odor was cute. So what if she whined and whimpered? I thought the noise was cute. So what if she did her business on my pillow? Can't say I thought that was cute, but I didn't mind. Mom and Dad had made it clear in our... Pren... Sorry, I cannot read this word. Prenuptial. Prenuptial agreement. That I was to be Liz's caretaker, and I was happy to oblige. I cleaned her... I cleaned her little eating dish and opened her can of puppy food. The minute she le leaped up, so the minute, I'm sorry, the minute she lapped up some water, I replenished it. I kept her hair, hair combed and her tail wagging. Within a few days, however, my feelings changed a bit. Liz was still my dog, and I was still her friend. But I grew weary of her barking, and she seemed hungry and awfully locked. More than once, my folks had to remind me. Take care of her. She is your dog. I didn't let hearing those words. I didn't like hearing those words, your dog. I wouldn't have minded the phrase, your dog to play with, or your dog when you want her, or even your dog when she is behaving. But those weren't my parents' words. They said, Liz is your dog, period, in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer. In dryness and in wetness. That's when it occurred to me. I am stuck with Liz. The courtship was over and the honeymoon had ended. 
we were mutually leashed. Liz went from an option to an obligation to a pet to a chore to someone to play with to someone to care for. Perhaps you can relate. Chances are you know the cla claustrophobia that comes with commitment. Only instead of being reminded, she is your dog, you're told, he is your husband, or she is your wife, or he is your child, parent, employee, or boss, or roommate, or any other relationship that requires loyalty for survival. Sorry, hold on. Such permanence can lead to panic. At least it did in it at least it did in me. I had to answer some tough questions. Can I tolerate the same flat nosed, hairy, hungry face every morning? You wives know the feeling. Am I going to be barked at until the day I die? Any kids connecting here? Will she ever learn to clean up her own mess? Did I hear an amen from some parents? Stuck, wait. Stuck it itis. That is a weird word, okay. He writes these like phrases that are like so weird. Such are the questions we ask when we feel stuck with someone. There is a word for this condition. Being consulting the one word medical d dictionary. Wait. Upon consulting the one word medical dictionary. I wrote the day before I crafted this chapter. I discovered that this condition is a common malady, malady, M A L A D Y, malady, known as stuck it itis. Stuck meaning trapped. It itis being the six letters you tag on to any word you want to sound impressive. Read it out loud. Stuck it itis. I actually like that word. It says Max's Manual of Medical Terms has this to say about the condition. Attacks of stuck it itis are limited to people who breathe and typically occur somewhere between birth and death. Stuck stuck it itis manifests itself in irritability short fuses, and a mountain range of molehills. <laughs> the common, I love how he writes, he just, I love Mexicano. The common symptoms of stuck at itis victims is the repetition of questions beginning with who, what, and why. Who is this person? What was I thinking? Why didn't I listen to my mother? Yeah. <laughs> this prestigious manual identifies three ways to cope with stuck at itis. Flee, fight, or forgive. Some opt to flee, to get out of the relationship and start again elsewhere, though they are often surprised when the condition surfaces on the other side of the fence as well. Others fight. Houses become combat zones and offices become boxing rings and sessions become a way of life. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. I'm sorry. Offices become boxing rings and tension becomes a way of life. A few, however, discover another treatment. Forgiveness. My manual has no model for how forgiveness 
how forgiveness occurs, but the Bible does. Jesus himself knew the feeling of being stuck with someone. For three years, he ran with the same crowd. By and large, he saw the same dozen or so faces around the table, around the campfire, around the clock. They rode in the same boats and walked the same roads and visited the same houses. And I wonder, how did Jesus stay so devoted to his men? Not only did he have to put up with their visible oddities, he had to endure their invisible foibles. Think about, think about it. He could hear their unspoken thoughts. He knew their private doubts. Not only that, but he knew their future doubts. What if you knew every mistake your loved ones had ever ma made and every mistake they would ever make? What if you knew every thought they would have about you? or in irritation, in dislike, in betrayal. Was it hard for Jesus to love Peter, knowing Peter would someday curse him? Was it tough to trust Thomas, knowing Thomas would one day question Jesus' resurrection? How did Jesus resist the urge to recruit a new batch of followers. John wanted to destroy one enemy. Peter sliced off the ear of another. Just days before Jesus' death, his disciples were arguing about which of them were, was the best. How was he able to love people who were hard to like? Few situations stir panic like being trapped in a relationship. It's one thing to be stuck with a puppy, but something else entirely, to be stuck in a marriage. We may chuckle over goofy terms like stuck at itis, but the but for many, this is no laughing matter. For that reason, I think it wise that we begin our study of what it means to be just like Jesus by pondering his heart of forgiveness. How was Jesus able to love his disciples? The answer is found in the 13th chapter of John. With towel and basin. Of all the times we see the bowing knees of Jesus, nowhere is the precious, nowhere is so precious as when he knelt before his disciples and washes their feet. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already promoted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things upon his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And then it says, verses 1 through 5, NIV. It has been a long... It, it, uh, it has been a long day. Jerusalem is packed with Passover guests, most of whom clamor with a glimpse... Most of them who, 
oh my gosh, most of the most of whom clamor for a glimpse of the teacher. The sp the spring sun is warm, the streets are dry, and the disciples are a long way from home. A splash of cool water would be refreshing. The disciples enter one by one and take their places around the table. On the wall hangs a towel and on the floor sits a pitcher and a basin. Any one of the disciples could volunteer for the job, but not one does. After a few moments, Jesus stands and removes his outer garment. He wraps a servant's girdle around his waist, takes up the basin, and kneels before one of the disciples. He unlaces a sandal and gently lifts the foot and places it in the basin covers it with water and begins to bathe it. One by one, one grimy foot after another, Jesus works his way down the row. In Jesus' day, <coughs> the washing of feet was a task reserved not for servant, not f just for servants, but for the lowest of servants. Every circle has its pecking order, and the circle of household works, workers was no exception. The servant at the bottom of the totem pole was expect, expected to be the one on his knees with the towel and basin. In this case, the one with the towel and basin is the king of the universe. Hands hands that shaped the stars now wash away filth. Fingers that formed mountains now massage toes. And the one before whom all nations will one day kneel now kneels before his disciples, hours before his own death. Jesus' concern is similar. He wants his disciples to know how much he loves them. More than removing dirt, Jesus is removing doubt. Jesus knows what will happen to his hands at the circle. I'm sorry, crucifixion. Some of these words I haven't actually seen. Crucifixion within 24 hours. They will be pierced and lifeless. Of all the times we'd expect him to ask for the disciples' attention, this would be one, but he doesn't. You can be sure Jesus knows the future of their feet he is washing. Their 24 feet will not spend the next day following their master, de defending his cause. Their feet will dash for cover at the flash of a Roman sword. Only one pair of feet won't abandon him in the garden. One disciple won't desert him at Gethsemane. Judas won't even make it that far. He will abandon Jesus that very night at the table. I looked for a Bible translation that reads, Jesus washed all the disciples' feet except the feet of Judas. But I couldn't find one. What a passionate moment when Jesus silently lifts the feet of his betrayer and washes them in the basin. Within hours, the feet of Judas, cleansed by the kindness of the one he will betray, will stand in Caiaphas' court. Behold the gift Jesus gives his followers. He knows what they, these men are about to do. 
he knows they are about to perform the vilest act of their lives. By morning, they will bury their heads in shame and look down at their feet in disgust. And when they do, he wants them to remember how his knees knelt before them and he washed their feet. He wants them to realize those feet are still clean. You don't understand now what I am doing, but you will understand later. John thirteen seven, Remarkable. He forgives their sin before they even commit it. He offered mercy before they even sought it. From the basin of his grace. Oh, I could never do that, you object. The hurt is so deep. The wounds are so numerous. I... I... Wait. Just seeing the person causes me to cringe. (coughs) Perhaps that is your problem. Perhaps you are seeing the wrong person. Or at least too much of the wrong person. Remember, the secret of being just like Jesus is fixing our eyes on him. Try shifting your glance away from the one who hurt you and setting your eyes on the one who has saved you. (coughs) Note the promise of John. But if I leave, but if I live in the light as God is in the light, we can share fellowship with each other. Then the blood of Jesus, God's son, cleanses us from every sin. 1 John 1, seven. Aside from geography and chronology, aside from geography and chronology, our story is the same as the disciples. We weren't in Jerusalem and we weren't alive that night. But what Jesus did for them, he has done for us. He has cleansed us. He he has cleansed, cleansed our hearts from sin. Even more, he is still cleansing us. John tells us we are being cleansed from every sin by the blood of Jesus. Just in other words, we are always being cleansed. The cleansing is not a promise for the future, but a reality in the present. Let a speck of dust fall on the soul of a saint and it is washed away. Let a spot of filth land on the heart of God's child, and the filth is wiped away. Jesus still cleans his disciples' feet. Jesus still washes away stains. Jesus still purifies his people. Our Savior kneels down and gazes upon the darkest acts of our lives. But rather than recoil in horror, he reaches out in kindness and says, I can clean that if you want. And from the basin of his grace, he scoops a palm full of mercy and washes away our sin. But that's not all he does. Because he lives in us, you and I can do the same. Because he has forgiven us, we can forgive others. Because he has a forgiving heart, we can have a forgiving heart. We can have a heart like his. If I, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you shall also wash each other's feet. I did this as an example so that you should do as I 
have done for you. John 13, 14 and 15. Jesus washes our feet for two reasons. The first is to give us mercy. The second is to give us a message. And that message is simple. Simply this. Jesus offers unconditional grace. We are to offer unconditional grace. The mercy of Christ preceded our mistakes. Our mercy must precede the mistakes of others. Those in the circle of Christ had no doubt of his love. Those in our circle should have no doubt about ours. What does it mean to have a heart like his? It means to kneel as Jesus knelt, touching the grimy parts of the people we are stuck with and washing away their unkindnesses with kindness. Or as Paul wrote, be kind and loving to each other and forgive each other just as God forgave you in Christ. Ephesians 4 Uh, 32. But Max, you are saying, I've done nothing wrong. I'm not the one who cheated. I'm not the one who lied. I'm not the guilty party here. Perhaps you aren't, but neither was Jesus. Of all the men in that room, only one was worthy of having his feet washed, and he was the one who washed the feet. The one worthy of being served, served others. The genius of Jesus' example is that the burden of bridge building falls on the strong one, not on the weak one. The one who is innocent is the one who makes the gesture. And you know what happens? More often than not, if the one in the right volunteers to wash the feet of the one in the wrong, both parties get on their knees. Don't we all think we are right? Hence, we wash each other's feet. Please understand. Relationship, relationships don't thrive because the guilty are punished, but because the innocent are merciful. And that sentence is, um, the whole sentence is italicized. The power of forgiveness. Recently, I shared a meal with some friends. A husband and wife wanted to tell me about a storm they were weathering. Through a series of events, she learned of an act of infidelity that had occurred over a decade ago. He had made the mistake of thinking it'd be better not to tell her, so he didn't. But she found out, and as you can imagine, she was deeply hurt. Through the advice of a counselor, the couple dropped everything and went away for several days, a decision had to be made. Would they flee, fight, or forgive? So they prayed. They talked. They walked. They reflected. In this case, the wife was clearly in the right. She could have left. Women have done so for lesser reasons. Or she could have stayed and made his life a living hell. Other women have done so, but she chose a different response. On the 10th night of their trip, my friend found a card on his pillow. On the card was a printed verse. I'd rather do nothing with you than something without you. Beneath the verse, she had written these words. And this is italics. I forgive you. I love you. Let's move on. The card might as well 
have been a basin, and the pen might as well have been a pitcher of water for that a pitcher of water for out of it poured pure mercy, and with it she washed her husband's feet. Certainly conflicts can be resolved only with uh, certain conflicts can be resolved only with a basin of water. When any relationships in your world I'm sorry are any relationships in your world thirsty for mercy? Any sitting around your table who need to be assured of your grace? Jesus made sure his disciples had no reason to doubt his love. Why don't you do the same? Since you have been chosen by God who has given you this new kind of life, and because of his deep love and concern for you, you should practice tender-hearted mercy and kindness to others. And that's italicized. Colossians 3.12. And then it says, TLB, I don't know if that's the Living Bible or, I'm not quite sure. That is chapter 2, and I just love this whole idea of washing the feet and just, I just love this whole thing of just, you know, God forgiving us and I don't know how to explain it, it just, I just love that whole chapter and it just spoke volumes to me, especially the first time I read it. I was just in shock. I didn't really know what to think. I, It was just amazing, amazing. And I hope that touched you in some way. And then chapter 3 is the one that I cried on. This really related to me as having a disability. And just the way that we interact with people that might be untouchable or people that are different or people that you may think are like gross or nasty or not like you. Um, so I just really like this chapter. This is chapter three and it's called The Touch of God, A Compassionate Heart. And give me one second, I cannot pause this video because I'm recording live on YouTube but I have to get a drink, my mouth is dying. Okay, I'm so sorry. I had to do that. Okay. May I ask you to look at your hand for a moment? Look at the back, then the palm. Reacquaint yourself with your fingers. Run a thumb over your knuckles. What if someone were to film a documentary on your hands? <coughs> <clears throat> what if a producer was to tell your story based on the life of your hands? What would we see? As with all of us, the film would begin with an infant's fist, then a close-up of a tiny hand wrapped around mommy's finger. Then what? Holding on to a chair as you learn to walk? Handling a spoon as you learn to eat? We aren't too long into the future before we see your hand being affectionate, stroking daddy's face, or petting a puppy. Nor is it too long before we see your hand acting aggressively, pushing big brother, or yanking back a toy. All of us learn early that the hand is suited for more than survival. It's a tool an emotional of emotional expression. The same hand can help or hurt, extend or clench, lift someone up or shove someone down. Were you to show the documentary to your friends, you'd be proud of certain moments. Your hand extended with a gift. Placing a ring on another's finger. Doctoring another's finger. 
oh, sorry, doctoring a wound, preparing a meal, or folding, folding in prayer. And then there, there are other scenes. Shots of accusing fingers, abusive fists, hands taking more often than giving, Dis demanding instead of offering, wounding rather than loving. Oh, the power of our hands. Leave them unmanaged and they become weapons. Clawing for power, strangling for survival, seducing for pleasure. But manage them and our hands become instruments of grace. Not just tools in the hands of God, but, and this is underlined, God's very hands. Surrender them for their five-fingered appendages become the hands of heaven. That's what Jesus did. Our Savior completely surrendered his hands to God. The documentary of his hands has no scene of greedy grabbing or unfounded finger pointing. It does, however, have one scene after another of people longing for his compassionate touch. Parents carrying their children. The poor bringing their fear, the sinful shouldering their sorrow, and each who came was touched, and each one touched was changed. But none was touched or changed more than the unnamed leper of Matthew 8. When Jesus came down from the hill, from the hill, Great crowds followed him. Then a man with a skin disease came to Jesus. The man bowed down before him and said, Lord, can you heal me if you will? Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and said, I will be healed. And immediately the man was healed from his disease. Then Jesus said to him, don't tell anyone about this, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded for people who are made well. This will show the people what I have done. And then it says, verses, uh, um, verses 1 through 4, so it must be Matthew 8. Mark and Luke chosen to tell the same story, but with apologies to all three writers, I must say, none tell enough. Oh, we know the man's disease and his decision, but as to the rest, we are left with questions. The authors offered no name, no history, no description. The Ultimate Outcast. This is where I started crying last time, I think. Sometimes my curiosity gets the best of me, and I wonder out loud. That's what I'm about to do here. Wonder out loud about the man who felt Jesus' compassionate touch. He makes one appearance, has one request, and receives one touch. But that one touch changed his life forever. And I wonder if his story went something like this. For five years, no one touched me. No one. Not one person. Not my wife. Not my child. Not my friends. No one touched me. They saw me. They spoke to me. I sensed love in their voices. I saw concern in their eyes, but I didn't feel their touch. There was no touch. Not once, no one touched me. What is common to you, I coveted. Handshakes, warm embraces, a tap on the shoulder to get your attention, 
a miss, a kiss on the lips to steal a heart. Such moments were taken from my world. No, no, no one touched me. No one bumped into me. What I would have given to be bumped into, to be caught in a crowd, for my shoulder to brush against another's. But for five years, it has not happened. How could it? I have not, I was not allowed on the streets. Even the rabbis kept their distance from me. I was not permitted in my synagogue, not even welcomed in my own house. I can't read this. Oh my God. Hang on, sorry. I was untouchable. I was a leper and no one touched me until today. I wonder about this man because in New Testament times, leprosy was the most dreaded disease. The condition rendered the body a mass of ulcers and decay. Fingers would curl and gnarl. Blotches of skin would discolor and stink. Certain types of leprosy would numb nerve endings, leading to a loss of fingers, toes, even a whole foot or hand. Leprosy was death by inches. The social consequences were as severe as the physical. Considered contagious, the leper was quarantined, banished to a leper colony. In scripture, the leper is symbolic of the ultimate outcast. Infected by a condition he did not seek, rejected by those he knew, avoided by people he did not know, condemned to a future he could not bear. And in the memory of each outcast must have been the day when he for when he was forced to face the truth. Life would never be the same. One One year during harvest, my grip on the scythe seemed weak. The tips of my fingers numbed. First one finger, then another. Within within a short time, I could grip the tool but scarcely feel it. By the end of the season, I felt nothing at all. The hand grasping the handle might as well have belonged to someone else. The feeling was gone. I said nothing to my wife, but I know she suspected something. Sorry, my battery is going low. How could she not? I carried my hand against my body like a wounded bird. One afternoon, I plunged my hands into a basin of water, intending to wash my face. The water reddened. My finger was bleeding, bleed, bleeding freely. I didn't even know I was wounded. How did I cut myself? On a knife? Did my hand slide across the sharp edge of metal? It must have, but I didn't feel anything. It, it's on your clothes, too, my wife said softly. She was behind me. Before looking at her, I looked down at the crimson spots on my robe. For the longest time, I stood over the basin, staring at my hand. Somehow, I knew my life was being forever altered. 
Shall I go with you to tell the priest? She asked. No, I sighed. I'll go alone. I turned and looked into her moist eyes. Standing next to her was our three-year-old daughter. Squatting, I gazed into her face and stroked her cheek, saying nothing. What could I say? I stood and looked again at my wife. She touched my shoulder and with my good hand, I touched hers. It would be our final touch. I cannot read this. Oh, my God. Five years have passed and no one has touched me since until today. The priest didn't touch me. He looked at my hand, now wrapped in a rag. He looked at my face, now shadowed in a sorrow. I've never faulted him for what he said. He was only doing as he was instructed. He covered his mouth and extended his hand palm forward. You are unclean, he told me. With one pronouncement, I lost my family, my farm, my future, my friends. My wife met me at the city gates with a sack of clothing and bread and coins. She didn't speak, but by now friends had gathered. What I saw in their eyes was a precursor to what I've seen in every eye since. Fearful pity. As a, I stepped out, they stepped back. Their horror of my disease was greater than their concern for my heart. So they and everyone else I have seen since stepped back. The banishing of a leper seems harsh, unnecessary. The ancient East hasn't been the only culture to isolate their wounded. However, we may not build colonies or cover our mouths in their presence, but we certainly build walls and duck our eyes and a person needn't have leprosy to feel quarantined. One of my sadder memories involves my fourth grade friend, Jerry. He and a half dozen of us were an ever-present, inseparable fixture on the playground. One day, I called his house to see if we could play. The phone was answered by a cursing, drunken voice, telling me Jerry could not come over that day or any day. I told my friends what had happened. One of them explained that Jerry's father was an alcoholic. I don't know if I knew what the word meant, but I learned quickly. Jerry, the second baseman, Jerry, the kid with the red bike, Jerry, my friend on the corner, was now Jerry, the son of a drunk. Kids can be hard, kids can be hard, and for some reason we were hard on Jerry. He was infected, like the leper. He suffered from a condition he didn't create. Like the leper, he was put outside the village. The divorced know this feeling, so do the handicapped. The unemployed have felt it, as have the less educated. Some shun unmarried moms. We keep our distance from the depressed and avoid the terminally ill. We have neighborhoods and 
we have neighborhoods of immigrants, convalescent homes for the elderly, schools for the simple, centers for the addicted, and prisons for the criminals. The rest simply try to get away from it all. Only God knows how many Jerry's are in voluntary exile. Individuals living quiet, lonely lives, infected by their fear of rejection and their memories of the last time they tried. They choose not to be touched at all rather than risk being hurt again. Oh, how, oh, how I repulsed those who saw me. Five years of leprosy had left my hands gnarled. Tips of my fingers were missing as were portions of an ear and my nose. At the sight of me, fathers grabbed their children. Mothers covered their faces. Children pointed and stared. The rags on my body couldn't hide my sores, nor could the wrap on my face hide the rage in my eyes. I didn't even try to hide it. How many nights did I make my shake my crippled fist at the silent sky? What did I do to deserve this? But never a reply. Some think I sinned. Some think my parents sinned. I don't know. All I know is that I grew so tired of it all. Sleeping in the colony, smelling the stench. I grew so tired of the damnable bell. I required to wear around my neck to warn people of my presence as if I needed it. One glance of the and the announcements be one oh my god. One glance and the announcements began. Unclean, unclean, unclean. Several weeks ago I dared walk the road to my village. I had no intent of entering. Heaven knows I only wanted to look again upon my fields, gaze again upon my home, and see my persistence, the face of my wife. I did not see her, but I saw some children playing in a pasture. I hid behind a tree and watched their, them scamper and run. Their faces were so joyful and their laughter so contagious that for, a, for just a moment, I was no longer a leper. I was a farmer. I was a father. I was a man. Infused with their happiness, I stepped out from behind the tree, straightened my back, breathed deeply, and they saw me. Before I could retreat, they saw me, and they screamed, and they scattered. One lingered, though, behind the others. One paused and looked into my direction. I don't know, and I can't say for sure, but I think, really think, she was my daughter. And I don't know, I really can't say for sure, but I think she was looking for her father. That look is what made me take the step. Hold on. Keeps doing that. It's annoying. There. Of course it was reckless. Of course it was risky. But what did I have to lose? He calls himself God's son. This is the hardest thing to read. You will not believe. The first time I read this, like, I couldn't even finish reading it. He 
Either he will hear my complaint and kill me or accept my demands and heal me. Those were my thoughts. I came to him as a defiant man, moved not by faith, but by a desperate anger. God had wrought this calamity on my body, and he would either fix it or end it. But then I saw him, and when I saw him, I was changed. You must remember, I'm a farmer, not a poet, so I cannot find the words to describe what I saw. All I can say is that the Judean mornings are sometimes so fresh and the sun rises so glorious that to look at them is to forget the heat of the day before and the hurt of times past. When I looked at his face, I saw a Judean morning. Before he spoke, I knew he cared. Somehow I knew he hated this disease as much as no more than I hate it. My rage became trust and my anger became hope. From behind a rock, I watched, my, I watched him descend a hill. Throngs of people followed him. I waited until he was only paces from me. Then I stepped out. Master, he stopped and looked in my direction as did dozens of others. A flood of fear swept across the crowd. Arms flew in front of Faces. Children ducked behind parents. Unclean, someone shouted. Again, I don't blame them. I was a huddly, huddled mass of death. But I scarcely heard them. I scarcely saw them. Their panic I'd seen a thousand times. His compassion, however, I'd never beheld. Everyone stepped back except him. He stepped toward me, toward me. Five years ago, my wife had stepped toward me. She was the last to do so. Now he did. I did not move. I was... Hold on. I did not move. I just spoke, Lord, you can heal me if you will. Had he healed me with a word, I would have been thrilled. Had he cured me with a prayer, I would have rejoiced. But he wasn't satisfied with speaking to me. He does, he drew near to me. He touched me. Five years ago, my wife had touched me. No one had touched me since, until today. I will. His words were as tender as his touch. Be healed. Energy flooded my body like water through a furrowed field. In an instant, in a moment. I felt warmth where there had been numb, numbness. I felt strength where there had been atrophy. My back straightened and my head lifted where I had been eye level with his belt. I now stood eye level with his face, his smiling face. He cupped, he cupped his hands around my cheek, cheeks and threw me so near I could feel the warmth of his breath and see the 
the wetness in his eyes. Don't tell anyone about this, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded for people who are made well. This will show the people what I have done. And so that is where I am going. I will show myself to my priest and embrace him. I will show myself to my wife and I will embrace her. I will pick up my daughter and I will embrace her. And I will never forget the one who dared to touch me. He could have healed me with a word, but he wanted to do more than heal me. He wanted to honor me, to validate me, to christen me. Imagine that unworthy of the touch of a man, yet worthy of the touch of God. The power of the godly touch. The touch did not heal, heal the disease, you know. Matthew is careful to mention that it was the pronouncement and not the touch of Christ that cured the condition. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and said, I will be healed. And immediately the man was healed from his disease. Matthew 8.3 the infection was banished by a word from Jesus. The loneliness, however, was treated with a touch from Jesus. Oh, the power of a godly touch. Haven't you known it? The doctor who treated you or the teacher who dried your tears? Was there a hand holding yours at a funeral? Another on your shoulder during a trial, a handshake of welcome at a new job, a pastoral prayer for healing? Haven't we known the power of a godly touch? Can't we offer the same? Many of you already do. Some of you have the master touch of the physician himself. You use your hands to pray over the sick and minister to the weak. If you aren't touching them personally, your hands are writing letters, dialing phones, baking pies. You have learned the power of a touch. But others of us tend to forget. Our hearts are good. It's just that our memories are bad. We forget who, how significant one touch can be. One fear saying the wrong thing or using the wrong tone or acting the wrong way. So rather than do it incorrectly, we do nothing at all. Aren't we glad Jesus didn't make the same mistake? If your fear of doing the wrong thing prevents you from doing anything, keep in mind the perspective of the lepers of the world. They aren't picky. They aren't finicky. They're just lonely. They are yearning for a godly touch. Jesus touched the untouchables of the world. Will you do the same? I'm sorry. I does, oh, and then it says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. James 1, 22 through 24 NIV. So I hope you guys enjoyed that and I hope it spoke to you um, as much as it spoke to me. That's the second time I've ever gotten to read that and I cried both times because it just, they started talking about the lepers and like 
just, that whole thing just gets me. I can't even, like, I get what he's saying and I get where he's coming from, but it just, it just really gets me and it just, I don't know, having a disability, somehow it seems different maybe than other people, but it just, I've always thought of that and... Max Lucado has talked about the untouchables a lot before, and we've talked about untouchables in Bible studies before, and I've mentioned this before, and um, it's just something that's always spoke to me and always just touched my heart and just always been something that just, um, it just changed my life and the way I think about people, and right after I met it, I changed my opinion of somebody that I didn't like, and I actually couldn't stand them. And I read that. And the next year was, like, completely different. And now we have a relationship. And it just changed the way I interact with people and the way I think about people and the way I judge people. And it just, I know, like, it changed two people's lives after reading that. Because, like, I was thinking about this person totally differently. And thinking things like... What if nobody else cares about that person? And what if nobody else is friends with that person? And what if I'm the only person who has a chance to make a difference? And what if she is, like, the this person that never knows what it's like to have a real friend or never knows what it's like to have a phone call or whatever? And it's a long story and it's hard to explain, but literally... The year after I read that, like, I I met this person and just everything totally changed and the way I saw her changed and the way that I look at people changed and it just everything is just completely different and I've never gotten that out of my mind. The leper thing has always been, like, in, ingrained into my mind and I've always, like, had a heart for people that society would consider outcasts or people that society would say aren't normal or whatever. But anyways, I just hope that that touched you um, as much as it touched me. And I hope you enjoyed it. And this video is getting really long, so I need to go. But I just had to read that to you because um, I've always wanted to share that with somebody because it's just amazing and it's the best thing I've ever read. And hopefully I don't get copyrighted, but we will find out. I don't have any fancy music or diving in blindly stuff to go along with this. It's just a serious, um, serious video. And um, I hope that you guys continue to strive to be just like Jesus. And I will talk to you later. Have a great evening and a happy new year. Two minutes ago, hey. Stop recording. Button.